I'm Everett Hufford. I've been blessed to be at this congregation since 1994, 20 years. During that time, I've been a part of the life of this church in a number of ways. Twice I preached for a year and as an interim between preachers. And then for 10 years, I've served as an elder. I've taught an adult Bible class for 15 years. And my wife and our family have been very much a part of, of this church. We love love the leaders, love the members, and the ministry and mission of this church. What I want to do in this uh, brief period is to expose you to some things that I think will help you as you become a member of a new congregation. You're coming into a large church, over 750 people, several services, many choices. The minute you get on campus, you really need a map. But what you need a map for is to know how to negotiate your spiritual life. It's one thing to find out where you actually need to sit or go on a Sunday morning for a class or a service. But what we are very concerned about is where your spiritual life goes while you're here. I want to begin by reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, just a couple of verses. And I'm going to use this as a base for at least the concerns I know the shepherds of this congregation have, but I think all of the ministry team and your fellow brothers and sisters in this church. When Paul was writing the church at Thessalonica, it's, in fact, it's one of his earliest letters, and this was one of the first churches in Europe, he has a concern about the, the fellowship that they share with each other. I'm going to begin reading in verse 12, and the NIV translates as brothers, but it's for everyone. If you'll look back through the, the uh, letter, you'll see that every time he talks about brothers, he's talking about the whole church, not just leaders or singling a group out. It should be just be believers. But he says, Now we ask you, verse 12, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you and who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, here again, and he zeroes in on his concern for everybody in that congregation. And we urge you, brothers, sisters, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. I see this applied particularly when someone comes new into a larger church because the size of a church can make a lot of difference. If this were a church of 100 people, and I assume you could find a church of 100 people here in this Memphis area if you had chosen to go to a smaller church, you would quickly know most of the adults in that congregation. A church of 750, it's much more difficult to get close to people. And so you, you kind of need a map. And, and if you're coming with a lot of Challenges. It's going to make this a bit difficult. Let me let me give you some examples. The last thing we'd want you to do, two years from now, is to be idle as a member of this congregation because spiritually that's not good for you. It's certainly not good for the congregation because God has sent you here for some reason, and we need to find out what that reason is. If you came here to hide, it's possible, easy to do in a larger church but it won't help you grow spiritually. Because here's, here's something that I hope that you will agree with me on, that if you happen to have to move in the next few years or go to, you know, you get transferred out of the city, whatever it is, that you could say that being in this congregation was the best thing for your spiritual health. But if you're idle, then we haven't blessed you and you haven't blessed us with your gifts. Timid is the second thing he says, Encourage the timid. And if this discovery worships about anything, it's encouraging you to get actively involved in the life of this church. You can be timid for a lot of reasons. Believe it or not, I'm introverted. I was very shy in my younger years. And the last thing I'd want to do is stand and speak in front of a camera. Maybe you're that way. The last thing you'd want to do is speak up in front of this group or a group here at the church. You're just a timid, shy person. That's okay. God still has given you gifts. But when it comes to spirituality, there's a whole other dimension of this. If you're timid about using the gifts God has given you, that's a spiritual issue. If you're timid because you don't feel comfortable here or you don't know anybody, that too is a relational, that's a relational issue that impacts what you do within this church. 
and hopefully in a few years, maybe in a few months, at least with some people in this church, you won't be timid. You'll be bold. You'll ask questions. You'll engage. You'll challenge. You'll be open. Because the only way God can work in our lives is for us opening our hearts to other people. When we're timid, we're withdrawn, we're isolated. It's hard to say that we're walking in fellowship with others and we don't let others, anyone, into our life. That was never God's design. He says, help the weak. As I'll illustrate in a moment, we typically have people coming new to our congregation, as in any church, from two different perspectives. One is you may be a new Christian, a new believer, just been baptized into Christ, and this is a whole new world for you. Your, your journey in this congregation is going to be a bit different than someone else who's been a Christian all their life, second, third generation Christian, and this may be the fourth congregation you've been a part of. Let me say a little bit about the latter group. You're coming here, you're coming with some pre, sort of some baggage or some previous experiences. And that's going to have a lot to do with whether you come in and grow spiritually or whether you kind of stay where you are. I know there's some Christians are weak today because they've been abused by a church. Churches can abuse. It could be that their own personal spiritual life has fallen apart and they're not even sure they're going to be accepted if people only knew what's been going on in their lives and they feel very weak. And You're, you're going to... Be glad to know that as you engage in the lives of people in this congregation, we're pretty genuine and authentic, and you're not going to need to be afraid of that. But if you're weak, the last thing the shepherds of this church would want is for you to still be weak a year or two years from now. And we want to do everything we can to help you. And then be patient with everyone. Um, Paul annoys me frequently. And this is one of those places. Why couldn't he have said, be patient with some of the people? Well, to ask me to be patient with everyone is a stretch because I quite frankly don't like everybody. And in a church this size, I can guarantee we will provide people that you're not going to want to be patient with. Yet Paul raises the bar for our own spiritual development, says be patient with everyone. You're going to be given some documents of the church here. One of them is uh, who we are. We're authentic, missional, courageous, empowered, graceful. But you'll notice on nearly all of these documents, you'll find our mission statement, which is to serve everyone in our diverse community, to lead the lost to Christ, and to help us all become fully mature Christians. Well, I think you can see why I'd like to start with 1 Thessalonians 5. If you've become a mature Christian, then you might not find yourself in this category of idol because you're going to find yourself quickly involved using your spiritual gift in some dimension of the life of this church. You're not going to be timid, at least in some facet of your spiritual life. You're going to be engaged and involved in service and growing and maturing. And if you're coming weak, we want to find healing for you so that when you become whole, you can now serve God effectively here. Your patience will be signs of the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And then you're doing what we're hoping that we'll do as a church to help you become a fully mature Christian. I mentioned earlier, I raised the question, why did God send you here? I don't know if you're asking that question because sometimes I know when we choose a church, we choose it more as a consumer. We want to know what the church gives us, not so much why God has put this church in our life. So I'm hoping now that you're a member of this congregation, you're going to put the, the choice behind and now try to see how God has been working behind the scenes. In God's providence, something has happened to connect you with this body of believers. And I think we all, leaders in this congregation and you, have a responsibility to try to find out why you are here and why has God put this church in your life. Well, I've said several things about being a healthy Christian, a mature Christian, but there's more involved in this because not only are you coming as a either young Christian 
new Christian, transfer from someplace else, and, and, and it's about you, and I realize you've got your, you're, you're dealing with a lot here, but I'm also aware that you're coming into a bigger context. So let me talk a little bit about a healthy church. What makes a church healthy? Well, I have four things that I typically use to describe a healthy church. And you might call this my map. You're given a physical map of our campus, but this would be my spiritual map of your engagement in the life of this church. I start with what is spiritual. The spiritual life of the church involves its worship, involves its ministry, it involves how it handles and copes with crises, it involves how accepting we would be of other people. You know, Paul tells the church in Rome, accept one another as Christ accepts you. That's, a, that's an incredibly strong spiritual principle that's very difficult to apply. But as we grow spiritually as a church, it certainly impacts people all around us. But I also evaluate a church on the basis of relationships, how well people get along. And this is where the size of the church makes a huge difference because small churches don't have a lot of ministries, they don't have a lot of activities because they're limited by the very fact that they have very few people and resources. And possibly one of the reasons this congregation was attractive to you is because we do in fact have a lot of options here. But here's a surprising fact to you possibly. The larger the church is, the less the volunteerism is. Because you look around and you think, wow, oh, there's all these people. They surely don't need me to teach class. They don't need me to be involved in youth ministry. They don't need me to be involved. You know, apparently I'm not really needed here, so I can continue as a consumer. Not so. Because we have more and more work to be done. We need more of us working together as a team. And we would really love to see every new member become actively a part of the core of the life of this church. Here's how that happens. Actively involved in a Bible class. Because our Bible classes are structured, and this is where I'm going to get into organization, how we're organized as a large church. The shepherding is organized through Bible classes. So if you're actively involved in a Bible class, your name is going to be on some shepherd's list. You're on his radar in that family. And there are opportunities then for interaction with some spiritually mature leaders within this congregation. We encourage small groups. Typically they've been formed within these Bible classes. So there may be a dozen people on Sunday nights from one of these classes that you'll be attending that you want to plug into that and get to know some of them. I, I, if I were new and I'm in a class, I'd visit every small group they had the first few months just to get a feel of people and find a place that I think I can fit. But that's building of those relationships. Here's a pretty well-researched observation in churches. If after six months you do not have at least five or six new friends in this congregation, you will probably end up idle and weak. But that's not our desire. We want you to be actively involved and challenged and, and grow spiritually. And so your relationships are going to be important. If we're not accepting, we have a responsibility. And your responsibility is go ahead and, you know, take a chance and, and, and engage and and accept invitations to the small groups and the Bible classes and get engaged in the life of a group within this church. The third thing I use to evaluate the strength of a church is organization. It's the rib work of a church. You, you just can't function without it. it. It's more than just deciding who does what when. It, it's a way to organize the gifts that we have, opportunities for service. If you take our mission statement, serve our diverse community, lead the loss of Christ, and become fully mature Christians, there's not a one of those that can be done without organization. None of them happen by accident. They're intentional. And in order to do that, we have a responsibility then to work with members. We, you know, a church this size, no leader is going to know everyone, but there should be avenues to where you'll know some of the leaders and that they will then help encourage you and nurture you in your faith. I left this till last because it's where I want to begin and end, because I did mention earlier in terms of our mission statement as a church. 
There are two words used interchangeably in our day and time, but I'm, I'm going to define them partic with particular, in a particular way. Vision is God's plan for us that was from the very beginning. If you go to Genesis 12, it was God's vision that through Abraham's seed, all nations of the world would be blessed. Well, if you read the rest of the Bible and you read the New Testament, you'll find that it was pretty clear to the writers of the New Testament that Jesus was the fulfillment of that vision to Abraham that through Christ all nations of the world would be blessed. So there's a, there's a deep spiritual root to our vision. And I would put vision here. In other words, vision drives our mission. And vision will never change. Um, the vision that God had to be a blessing impacted the mission of Moses or of Abraham earlier of John the Baptist, of, of any leader that you read about in the Bible, every one of them were doing what they were doing because they were a part of God's vision, but every one of them had a different mission. We know Abraham's mission was a bit different than Moses, than Joshua, than, and on and on you go. Now, how does that relate to us? God has a vision. We're still a part of that vision. Until the Lord comes again, His vision will never change. He expects us, White Station. Now you're a part of us. To be a blessing to our community and the world. That's his vision. Now how we do it in any given time is going to change. You may wonder why this church is not located on the White Station Boulevard or Road. Well, this district, this area was called White Station because when the train came out there, there was a station called White Station. That's why White Station High School is not on White Station Street and so on. And in those days, this was a you know, a growing new suburb of Memphis. But the White Station area today is very different than it was 50 years ago. People who live in the neighborhood, the, the businesses in this neighborhood. Why, there was a golf course over there where uh, now you go to Target. <laughs> Things have changed. Our mission will change with our context. This is always changing, driven, however, by the vision of God. So our mission, serve our diverse community. We didn't start that way because we did not have a diverse community. And if you look around this room that you're in today and there's some diversity in the room, God must be smiling because we are fulfilling our vision of diversity and ethnicity and in socioeconomic background and in age and all of that. We want the church to look like the community. So much so that we have made a specific commitment to not move from this location. That may sound strange because if you notice the history of churches in Memphis, they have tended to move out of town. It's not just Memphis. It's an urban reality. Churches tend to leave communities. I'm third generation missionary and my grandfather is buried in, in Israel, died there as a missionary. My parents have been in Egypt and Jordan and Lebanon, and I've been in Israel and Jordan. And You know, I, I just always grew up with a sense of mission. and I've, I can't understand why a church would leave its community. But I also can't understand why you would want to be in this church and not be a part of its mission in this community. It could be that if you're a new Christian, you're actually a recipient of our mission. We've helped lead you to Christ, and now we deeply need your gifts and your network and your, your relationships to help us continue to fulfill the mission that God has given us through His vision. We want to bless our community. That's why the Community Life Center is as big a statement of how we want to bless our community as you can find anywhere. Just sit outside any day of the week and watch as people come and go into our community and see how we've become a blessing to this community. We really, really want to do God's will within this context. Now, let me uh, go back through this a little bit and ask some questions in terms of where, where do you fit uh, into this? How do you grow spiritually in a new church? And I'm sure it was a pretty bold decision on your part to decide to become a part of this congregation, particularly if you didn't know very many people here. But now that you're here, please use every opportunity we give to study the Word, to pray, 
You'll notice at the end of every service, we have we provide an opportunity for for prayer partners, for for someone that can come alongside of you and share a burden and pray about it, and be a reminder that. We are God's presence as a church in your life because we truly want to be a blessing. I also look at uh, the spiritual as sort of why we do what we do. And you'll find as elders make decisions and as church ministry team make decisions, it's not a matter of just running a big corporation and making profit and so on. This is definitely a nonprofit organization driven with a strong sense of mission. And our study of the Bible is not just so you can study the Bible or just because it's a tradition. It's because we truly believe that within those words are, are the words of life. And the more we are go, going deeper into the heart of the Word of God, we're growing deeper into the heart of God. But we cannot do it alone. God never intended us to do it alone. So it's also who... I'll get it right there. Who you're with and who you associate with, that you're in fellowship with them. In fact, in in 1 John, John comes to the conclusion that you cannot say yes to Jesus, which is a spiritual thing, and no to the church. That's just not a, it's just not the truth. The truth is if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we are close to one another. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. So we, we want... This bond to be very close. We, we want a path. And there are a lot of things that you'll find in this congregation that will make that way for you, for you to grow spiritually and develop in your relationships with others. How you do this? Uh, small groups. And Bible class. And on and on it goes. And we encourage you to bring friends. We hope you're comfortable, even with your friends, and that you'll find within the the various pockets of relationship within this congregation, people that you can identify with, who will identify with you, and help you in your walk with the Lord. Now, when it comes to organization, this, this has to do with how we do what we do. How do we do this? How are we organized? Elders are very well organized, and we can explain that on another occasion, but uh, you'll find that the elders and ministry team are always meeting and strategizing and working toward the health and life of this church. And then it's the mission again. The mission has to do with where we're going. We want strong bonds all over here. All of these are connected. And the mission is where are we going? And we're going to our diverse community. We're going global as you'll find in, in what we do as, as, as a mission church. I want to say a little bit about the different size makes in this whole dynamic. Uh, and let me connect these together. Every one of these are connected. Um, in a large, what I've discovered in doing church consulting that in a large church, usually They're stronger at organization and mission and weaker in spirituality and relationships. It kind of makes sense. It's hard to plug in, fit in, and so on, which is why we're having this conversation. In a smaller church, they tend to be very spiritual. You've got people who are very committed to the group. They know everybody, love everybody, and they're very relational. In fact, so relational, they become a clique, sort of a sealed-off group, which is the reason you can find dotted all throughout our community, a lot of small churches, because they just got sealed off in terms of relationships. They, they couldn't find room at the core for more people, and so as a result, we plant more smaller churches. But the problem with that is so much of their resources are spent on themselves, it's hard to ever get to mission. You're blessed to be here, because we're at a church where we've got the resources and the potential and opportunities to continue to keep all of this healthy, assuming that as a new member in this congregation, you're very much a part of what we're doing. I'm going to get a couple of minutes. Let me say something about the track that you go on. If you're a new Christian, 
then this is where you start. You start with spirituality. And I would say, look at yourself moving around this direction. You've been a product of our mission in a sense. We've, we've reached out to you and helped you in, in whatever way come to faith in Christ. And now you're growing spiritually. But your spiritual growth will not go beyond your relationships with others. So we, again, we want to encourage you to do that. If you're transferring from another congregation, you're very likely starting here with developing new relationships and you're going to need to ask the question, how do I use my gifts in this congregation? That's a spiritual question. God sent me here to use my gifts. How do I plug that in? And how do my gifts fit our mission? So whether you come in as a new Christian or transferring from another congregation, we want all of this to impact your own development within this congregation. So when you leave, it can be very clear to you and to all around that this church has been a blessing in your life and you have, in fact, grown spiritually. I hope what I've said doesn't sound too tough or harsh. I just want to deal with reality. And the reality is we love you as a church. We're opening our hearts to you. I hope you will open your hearts to us. And that whatever time God gives us in this journey together, we will all be drawn deeper into the heart of God. And it will we can see the fulfillment of, of the mission God has given us to serve our diverse community, to lead the lost to Christ, and to all become fully mature Christians. May God bless you on that journey.